Hello everyone, uh, this is Diogo Montanas Lopez and I will be speaking today about the effectiveness of L1 norm based channel pruning for convolutional neural network verification. Uh, this is joint work with uh, my lab mate Patrick Mitchell, my advisor Taylor Johnson from the Very Vital uh, Group uh, uh, from Vanderbilt University. For today, uh, we're going to start talking about uh, the task at hand, the image classification using the Cypher 10 dataset. Uh, then we're going to explain adversarial attacks and the specific adversarial attack that we're going to use in this work. Uh, a little bit of the book convolution on our side, the, the ones we're going to use and what training is, and the technique used in this work. And then the, we're going to talk about the robustness uh, verification work that we're doing uh, using NMB and the ensembles. So let's start with the image classification task. So this classification uh, this consistent. We get a, an image as an input through the neural network, and we need uh, the neural network to uh, have us an output the specific class that the image corresponds to. So in this case, we have and variables, so we have airplanes at the more very class, etc. And we want uh, to make sure that even under certain uh, perturbations to the original image, our neural network can classify this image of an airplane to an as an airplane. And so, so we chose these uh, C four ten data sets for no specific reason. We could have used uh, another ones like MNIST C four hundred or ImageNet, but uh, we might consider some of these in, in the future. Uh, so let's see what uh, other attacks are. So a virtual attacks usually consist on we preserve some pixels in the image and we make the CNN or other model to misclassify this image. Uh, in this case, by uh, modifying some of the pixels in the stop sign image, we can uh, we get that the neural network uh, misclassifies this one as a speed limit of uh, 45 miles per hour. Um, perturbations on the pixels can be optimized, such as the fast gradient side method uh, that is optimized with respect to the neural network that will be used, or it can be random, such as the uh, random noise attacks or uh, others. In our case, we're going to use the brightening attacks that we'll uh, explain. The brightening attack consists on preserving the brightest images in uh, the picture. So, uh, in general, we set a threshold value for the uh, all the pixels, and if this pixel is greater than the threshold, then we modify the value of the pixel to uh, make it brighter. So, in our implementation, if the uh, pixel value uh, is above the threshold, then we set the pixel uh, to be the brightest value minus delta to the brightest possible value yeah, in the image. So we set them the, all these pixels to be intervals rather than single values. Uh, so now we're going to speak about the convolutional neural networks used in this analysis. Uh, here we see an image that uh, represents one of uh, one convolutional neural network which in this case is, uh, has some convolutional uh, layers, some max layers, fully connected, and so forth. Uh, these uh, neural networks are uh, part of the deep learning uh, family, and they're distinguished uh, to other neural networks on the use of convolutional and pooling layers. Uh, they're very common uh, in computer vision tasks, such as image recognition and object detection. And in general, they are very large networks uh, compared to their networks like uh, FIFO neural networks that are used more in for simple uh, other simple tasks. Uh, in this study, we're gonna include uh, all these five layers, uh, including the max pooling, the convolutional 2D, radial layers, fully connected, and patch normalization layers. Uh, the neural networks employed in the study are the VGG family of neural networks. So we have uh, VGG 11, 13, 16, and 19. Uh, all these neural networks have a similar architecture. They just differ on the number of weight uh, layers in the network. 
uh, but they all share a similar architecture. So uh, they have the same number of maximum layers and they just have different size of the weight layers and number of them. So for each of these four uh, neural networks, we prune them using uh, uh, a pruning technique called N1 uh, neural based channel pruning. Uh, here in the table on the right, we can see that uh, we prune uh, around 63, 64% of the parameters in each uh, neural network. And we have neural networks that have go from 3.5 million parameters to like 20. So pruning in general consists on reducing the uh, storage and computational cost of uh, these neural networks. As this, uh, usually the state of the art conventional neural networks are very large. Uh, for object detection, image classification, and um, other tasks, they are in general very large and they're very costly to deploy on uh, smaller devices such as mobile phones. So, uh, in the past decade, uh, there have been uh, much research done in this area to analyze different ways of reducing the size of the networks without uh, reducing the accuracy of them. Uh, in our case, we're going to use the uh, L1 norm based channel pruning uh, published in 2017 by Lietal at the ICELR conference. This technique uh, focuses on removing filters of uh, the convolutional layers in the networks uh, that have the less impact on the uh, accuracy of the CNN. Uh, there are many techniques. Uh, some others focus on uh, reducing the size of the fully connected layers or the connections of them. But some of them have the uh, inconvenience of uh, creating sparsity in the network, which this one doesn't. Um, that way, you can use uh, general software rather than specific software to run uh, these sparsity networks. Uh, in our case, we're using uh, Python's implementation of this algorithm. Um, which is provided in by Eric uh, in the uh, Rethinking Network Pruning paper in, that was published in 2019, which has slightly modifications on uh, saving the files and uh, converting them into an index and so on. Uh, this is a technique that is able to reduce up to 64% of the parameters in uh, the standard neural networks, such as uh, VG16. So let's see. Uh, now we go talk about the neural network verification toolbox that we are developing at our lab, um, which is uh, based on reachability analysis. So this toolbox, the NMV is presented at CAF this year. Uh, and based on reachability analysis methods, we can analyze different deep learning models, such as P4 neural networks and convolutional neural networks. Uh, well, we are working on expanding the uh, number of uh, models that we can analyze. Uh, we have exact and over approximate methods for all of uh, them, uh, for well, for the linear and piecewise linear uh, models, and over approximate methods for the nonlinear ones in general. Um, one, some of the main features of uh, NMV is the use of the star set representations for uh, doing uh, reachability analysis. So for uh, regular FIFA neural networks, we have the star set that was uh, presented at FM last year with uh, their methods uh, explained there. And this year at CAV, we have another paper where we do reachability analysis of CNNs using image stars and what all the methods are explained. Uh, we also make use of CORA to analyze uh, control systems. So for in the case of uh, linear dynamics, we have implemented our own methods using star sets. Um, for the nonlinear and um, hybrid automata dynamics, we make use of uh, CORA's methods and integrate them in NMB to analyze these systems. Uh, we here have the link where the tool is available at, and we also provide the uh, Corrosion link for anyone who is interested in running uh, NMV. 
without a license or without uh, installing them. So how does feasibility analysis work in general? So we have an input set and a neural network and a property that we want to verify. So by propagating this input set to its layer, uh, we can verify the safety and robustness of neural networks. But so we do this exactly by, uh, in our case, we usually represent the property P as a set. So by com after computing the output set of the neural network, we compute the intersection of this output set and the property P. Uh, the property P usually will be the unsafe region, uh, or it's common to be the unsafe region. So if the intersection of the output set and this unsafe region is a node, we can say that the uh, neural network uh, satisfies the property, otherwise it doesn't. So for images, uh, how do we do this? Uh, so we create the sets of images by attacking a specific uh, pixels. And we uh, create intervals for these pixels, as I previously mentioned on the uh, brightness attack. And we represent this set of pixels as an image star, which is a generalization of the star set. Uh, so by having this set of this yeah, this set of pixels, uh, we can propagate uh, all of these, which represent technically a set of possible images within uh, all the combination of all the uh, pixel values. And we will evaluate all of these uh, images to see if it is, we can still guarantee that the uh, image will be classified as the correct label. So if we target an airplane picture, we still want to assure that the Neural network will uh, classify this image as an airplane. Uh, some of the challenges uh, of doing uh, verification of conversion neural networks is uh, due to the high dimensional input, the large number of parameters in the neural networks, as well as the nonlinear layers like the max pooling and average pooling layers. So I have briefly mentioned uh, visibility analysis and the verification. So this is an example. So let's say we apply an image of the airplane, we apply some noise, and we still verify that uh, the image uh, will be classified as, a, as an airplane. So by computing the output set of a neural network, we have 10 possible outputs that uh, are all 10 different intervals. So we look at the maximum uh, output interval and we see which index it is, and if it's the correct index, we can say that the uh, network is robust. In the case that two or more indices may be the maximum output, then if we have used over approximate methods, then if the one of the indexes is the correct label, then we will say that the result is unknown. Otherwise, it will still be, uh, the network will be not robust. So let's get into the results. So the evaluation that we have done in here is we take the four uh, conventional networks, all four VGG networks, 11, 12, uh, 11 13, 16, 19, and the Prun uh, networks as well. And we take random uh, images from the uh, test set of CFR10. And we uh, have three different experiments where we set uh, different number of uh, attack pixels in each of them and to evaluate uh, how robust are with respect to these pictures and how fast we are able to analyze them. Uh, all of them are evaluated under the brightening. At, uh, so here's the first result. Uh, experiment one consists on setting uh, a threshold of 240 out of a uh, 50 is the maximum possible value for these images. And we have a delta value of 0 0.01. So it will be like a 1% attack. Uh, which is very interesting to see is that the uh, smaller networks, VG11 and VG11 prune, are the ones that take the longest in average to analyze the images. Uh, they are the less robust, which in, 
it's interesting, but it's more interesting to see how the the time it's uh, so large in comparison to other uh, larger networks. Uh, looking deeper into the results, uh, we see that when the images uh, are attacked, so the value, the number of pixels attacked are larger than like 100, 150, it causes these PG11 networks to uh, take much longer than any other networks to be analyzed, which I am not sure why this is happening, but this is uh, some of uh, the future work that we're going to look into, have other smaller networks and other images and other data sets to see if this is something that happens in general, or it was just a one case thing. Uh, going to experiment two, here we see a, a pattern in the timing that it makes more sense to us if we thought about it previously. Uh, the smaller the networks are, the faster it is in general in average to analyze. Uh, here we can see that the VG11 uh, it's, uh, it takes a shorter than VG13 and so on. Uh, similar thing happens for uh, the experiment 3. So in experiment 2, what we have said is a maximum uh, value of 50 pixels per image that can be attacked. Anything else, uh, we throw it out. So we only analyze nine images in this case. Uh, for the uh, previous one, for the, uh, experiment one, we have a maximum value of uh, 400 pixels uh, per image. And for the last one, the last experiment, we set uh, lower and upper bound of the number of pixels that can be attacked. So we have a lower bound of 20 pixels and a maximum bound of and an upper bound of 50 pixels, uh, 80 pixels, sorry, that can be attacked uh, per image. Here we can see that uh, since all of them are at least 20 uh, pixels uh, attack, the time is longer in average than the experiment two, and we can also see the same, a similar pattern uh, in the time. However, we see that uh, on these 32 images chosen, the smaller networks seem to be more robust than the larger ones. So some takeaways that we can take from these uh, experiments is that size reductions doesn't always translate on uh, faster reachability analysis. As we have seen, uh, th there are some cases where the, the smaller networks take much longer than uh, some other uh, larger networks, even if they're like half of the size of the larger network. In order to, uh, Key point that we can see is that the input size, the input set size, is a key factor on the reachability analysis, and it can increase the uh, verification time significantly. Uh, however, it will be interesting to see if uh, these uh, experiments and results will translate into other uh, verification techniques and uh, pruning techniques, uh, but still. Uh, this is something that we will uh, be looking into in the future. Uh, we will also look into varying uh, architecture, having different uh, emulsion networks and different data sets, uh, such as C400, MNIST, and ImageNet. We will also look into uh, analyzing uh, these images and these networks here with other adversarial attacks and uh, see how the uh, reachability analysis uh, works and then um, what are the effects on, on these ones. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to thank my uh, lab mate, my collaborators, and my advisor, as well as uh, our sponsors, uh, RPNSF and all the other ones. Uh, thank you.